Back in 1996, Condor No. 50 took to the air as the first California Condor to fly free again in Arizona, thanks to a captive breeding program that has brought them back from the brink of extinction. You know, when you consider that there were 22 individuals in 1982, and today there are over 400 birds in total, the species has by far and away been saved from extinction, but now we're to the point where we have more birds in, in the wild than we have in captivity. That's a real turning point for a recovery effort. But on this windy day in 2016, these raptors aren't quite ready to take flight. Did they ever take flight? I nope. Don't know. They're just still sitting up there someplace. Joke's on us. Yeah, I hope we'll <laughs> I'm amazed every year that we have, you know, a couple hundred people drive whatever five hours from Phoenix or from Salt Lake. We've had people come from the other end of the country. We had people last year from Florida. And so to make the trek here to celebrate National Public Lands Day and the California Condor Recovery Program, uh, to be able to see a condor in the wild and participate, if you will, in one of the most endangered species recovery programs in, in the world, um, that's, I guess that's the draw. And, and today we had easily a couple hundred people. They're all here to catch a glimpse of the new birds, two young California condors raised for this Northern Arizona release. They come from Idaho and they manage them up in the flight pen up on top of the Priya Plateau. They're up there for several weeks and then they uh, move them into the release pen for about a week and a half or two weeks before we actually release these birds. They're out there to get to see other condors flying around and kind of get used to the environment before they uh, get released uh, uh, so it's not just throwing them out. The, the way that the, the release works here is that the birds are in the release pen and we, uh, at a set time, which was 11 o'clock, we opened the gates um, via, we told the people up at the release site to open the gates, and they remotely opened the gates so that they're not chasing the birds out, and we're letting the birds leave at their own will. And uh, today, it's a little bit windy, and the birds are not wanting to take their first flight in such a wind, so they're sitting in the, in the release pen right now, um, still haven't decided to come out yet. So it's what we would call a soft release in, in, uh, in wildlife work. It, it's better to do that with, with all wildlife that we can um, because uh, you're not just throwing them out. You, they're not having to you know, evolve or die kind of a situation. Um, they are having the leisure to come out on their own without stress and to figure things out without uh, um, being forced, having it forced upon them by us. And then when they do come out, the Peregrine Fund biologists are here to monitor their every movement for the next several weeks. They will be extremely well tracked by the Peregrine Fund uh, biologists and they, they will have essentially constant monitoring for the next several weeks until it's determined that they're doing really well or not. And if they're not doing really well, we may take them into captivity again just to see how they're, uh, if we can't acclimate them to the environment a little better. Um, but we've had a, a long history of really successful releases using this matter. On average, we release about a dozen birds a year, and that's usually, um, you know, twofold more than, than hopefully we lose. And last year, we only lost three birds, and so the addition of these two birds, we're getting close to maintaining that population. Uh, but ultimately, our goal is to see that through birds released from the captive breeding pro program, and birds that are produced in the wild that we result in a self-sustaining population is our ultimate goal. Today we have 74 birds in the population and um, yeah our goal is 150 um, and to be reproductively self-sustaining. So we're last year uh, this last season we had 12 pairs indicated by exposure so as the population grows in age they also grow in the number of breeding pairs and obviously you have to produce more birds than you lose so we're, we're in that process of building that self-sustaining population. So one of the things we do other than just releasing these birds is we monitor them intensively. We have radio telemetry devices on the birds so we can track them by ground and we also have some that have GPS transmitters and what we're trying to learn is, is what's important to these birds for survival. What are the things that, that uh, are causes of death and within those things that cause death are there any things that we can control? And so what we look at is the lead poisoning on the landscape as the condors come in after the hunting season and we test their blood sample, we found that they had high levels of lead. So we started working with the department and hunters to eliminate that source of poisoning by using non-lead bullets. 
and it's been terribly effective with the big game hunting population on the Kaibab. Um, over 80% participation for over seven years now. Um, now it's just a matter of how do we get the rest of the hunters who might be out there hunting to uh, use non-lead. So we're, we're now talking to hunters of small game and varmint hunters. And so those ongoing programs to reveal the problems that this condor is having and asking for support is, is the, at the crux of, of recovery. You can find out more about the recovery efforts for these amazing creatures on the Arizona Game and Fish Department website, 24-7 at azgfd.gov slash condor.